Hi everybody, I'm Lex Hall, Senior Editor for Morningstar Australia. You may recognise me from some of the videos that we've done on morningstar.com.au. I'm here today to welcome you to this special February earnings season webinar. I'm filling in for Mark LaMonica, who you may be familiar with from uh, Morningstar's series of webinars. I assure you that he'll be back on Thursday, so fear not. Uh, and with me today, of course, is Head of Equity Research, Peter Warns. And I'm sure he won't mind me embarrassing when I say that he's one of the most trusted voices in investing, has been since 1973 with his weekly newsletter that is a must read in Your Money Weekly. Together, we're going to discuss the earnings season, of course. We're going to dissect a few of the results, look at what lies ahead. And importantly, we want to hear from you. We want to know your questions. Perhaps you want to know about travel, whether it's ever going to return to normal. Perhaps you want to uh, ask about a valuation for a particular stock that you like. Is the surge in e-commerce going to continue, for example? Or perhaps you want, to something, you want to ask something a bit more macro on China or on the bond market, which has been moving lately, or perhaps on uh, stimulus. And the earnings report from Peter, which I mentioned, is out now on Morningstar sorry, premium .morningstar .com au. Be sure to visit morningstar.com.au as well. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. You can visit us there as well. And what else do I have to tell you? And before we continue, of course, the general advice nature of this webinar, please remember that it doesn't pertain to your particular circumstances. It's general in nature. We don't know what your objectives are or your circumstances. And we ask too that you keep that in mind when you ask your questions, try to keep them uh, general in nature. Uh, now I'll turn to Peter. Peter, it's um, the last time you and I did a webinar, I think, was back on Friday the 13th. I remember the day vividly when we we did. We were all set to do an earnings uh, webinar, I think, and then we realised what was happening. Uh, the market tanked. You, of course, said put some money on the table, and since then the market has rocketed. In your latest note, you say this reporting season has been the most remarkable yet. Why is that? Well, thanks for the, uh, the welcome. My pleasure. Uh, Lex, and thanks for everyone for, uh, for listening uh, and watching. It was March the 13th last year, and doesn't time fly. Uh, remarkable in the, uh, in the extent that COVID flew out of China in November last year. And the reporting season that we've just uh, have just concluded covers the period where the virus was at its most rampant between June and September across the globe. And so companies, economies were kneecapped by what had happened, the closures, the lockdowns, the restrictions, and companies had to deal with all those, those conditions, change conditions, conditions that they'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that's remarkable for that alone. Yep. And the companies have done pretty well to survive, quite frankly. Yep. Um, but don't forget, we, we report, the reports are history now. Mm. Uh, we have to look forward, but we also should recognise just how uh, companies did perform um, but more importantly, what what the the the, uh, the mechanisms that were put in place for them to survive mm. and to prosper, uh, and some of them did prosper. I just want to give um, uh, a couple of bullet points so we can put in context what Peter is talking about. Uh, it's been the best earnings season in Australia for six years. 55% of companies reported a rise in profits versus 36% in August. And of course, dividend payouts rose. We all feared that they would crumble. Uh, figures show that 48% of companies increased their dividends while only 33% cut them. Yeah. Well, it has been described as the, you know, uh, the strongest uh, reporting season in 20 years. Yeah. Now, strongest only in the, in the sense that um, what has happened is that there's been earnings uh, upgrades and the upgrades have massively out, outweighed the downgrades because it reflects 
no transparency, no guidance, and the conditions I've just explained to you, um, so that all the estimates went low. Yeah. Only the fools or brave went high. Mm -hmm. and, and because they were low, now what you've got is a consensus is saying, this is what's on the table. We're getting a little bit of guidance from uh, companies now, yeah. and, and now I'm upgrading. So it's, re it's the strongest because of the upgrades, okay. not because of the actual profits mm -hmm. and, and level of profits. Um, and so it's important that you know that we, that we reflect that that's that or suggest that that's a, that's the situation. And you, on that point, you've been warning us for weeks. You've been saying that weeks leading up to this that we we shouldn't necessarily take these results at face value, because if I can put it this way, the devil in the detail you've talked about is the lower operating expenses. How is how is that distorted result? Yeah. Well, I think as I said, you know, in the overview a few weeks ago, when be, pre the reporting season, I said, let's not extrapolate from the peaks or the troughs because you are, that's exactly what you're going to see. Yep. You're going to see the peaks from those companies who are exposed to retailing, people in lockdown that you know, are frustrated and, and, and just had to spend money and then their, their, their options to spend money um, for overseas travel and the entertainment and hospitality had could been curtailed significantly. So they were just going to go out there and hit, hit Jerry Harvey with an upper cup that he's never seen before. Yep. Now, so that happened. Mm -hmm. But then on the other side, Alan Joyce ain't too happy. Right? So it's peaks and troughs. So let's not extrapolate from those uh, levels uh, because, as I say, I'm, I will not see a reporting season reporting on the conditions that uh, we've experienced while I'm alive. Okay. I, th I don't think you're going to see it. I'm not going to live to 150, but I don't think you're going to see it. And and so it's important, therefore, to, to make sure that we recognise just what has happened. And as you say, revenues have been under pressure because of the contraction of the economy. The economic activity has been contracted and, and meaningfully. And therefore, revenue top lines with the exceptions, obviously, of the retail space and what have you, have generally been under pressure. Mm -hmm. but, but what companies have done, and again, because of government support through fiscal stimulus and, and, and uh, those uh, support job keeper and job keeper and a job seeker and, and other support programs, that that's allowed companies to redu significantly reduce their operating expenses which whether it's been on the wage front or what have you, but operating expenses, if you have a look at that line, um, and, and we're talking about cash here, and I'm not talking about de depreciation or amortization or anything, just that line, uh, you'll find that it, ha it has fallen at a faster rate than revenue, and therefore profits have increased and margins have widened. Mm -hmm. Now, that's past, that's history. What's gonna happen in future as we normalize and as the economy start to recover, and reopen and lockdowns uh, are a thing of the past and what have you, we will start seeing a normalisation. And what will happen is, yes, that the demand will start, in, in overall total demand will start to move up, but operating expenses, I believe, will start rising at a faster rate than revenue. Mm -hmm. And there's a good chance now that profit growth will slow dramatically and margins will get squeezed. Okay. Um, perhaps you agree with Peter on what uh, the outlook is going to be like. Uh, we've got a, some plenty of questions coming through, so uh, that's great. Keep them coming. I'll, I'll just get straight into them, actually. Annette Antoinette asks, why have some share prices fallen on the announcement of good results, which have met or beaten guidance? Are investors' expectations too high? And I remember when the market fell, I had, I had a list of stocks that were about 50 stocks were in five-star territory. So how do you respond to Antoinette? Well, the expectations were very high um, pre the, uh, the reporting season. Um, don't forget that we had, the, the vaccines were starting to roll out. Um, the stimulus packages were, were, you know, very, very evident, albeit they're starting to roll off now. But, but through that period that we've just reported on, um, you saw the peak of fiscal and monetary policy at work, um, and and we did, with and the amount of money that has been thrown at it basically is exceeds comfortably what was thrown at it in the GFC, and also 
the amount of money that was thrown at the vac to get a vaccine mm. also e almost equal how much money was um, thrown at the fiscal and, and, and monetary policy. And that's why we got a vaccine so quickly. Right. Um, so what... Antoinette, what has happened there is that the expectations were high. In fact, if I look at the the, the, the stocks that we I look at on this uh, this, this compendium, about a hundred stocks, um, I think 30, 35 of them um, we uh, we raised our our um, uh, fair value estimates, and we only cut them in five. And then, in terms of what happened on within the twenty four hours of uh, of the reports being uh, being released, in other words, strongly positive or strongly negative reactions in the market. Um, there, it was slightly in in, in uh, the negatives were slightly in front of the positives, mm -hmm. and that tells you that the expectations were inbuilt into the market. And don't forget, the market was quite elevated going into the reporting season as well. Okay, thank you, Antoinette, for that. Joe Rodrigo has a sort of triple. Um triple headed question, if I can put it that way, and he's referring to specific companies. One in particular is Woodside, the fair value is $40. Rod, Joe Rodrigo asks, Peter, the company seem to be doing well. Demand for natural gas is high and oil's gone up. The stock is struggling at around $24.50. Any comments, please, on the demand for natural gas and high fair value at $40? Uh, well, I think um, Natural gas and LP, uh, LNG demand will continue to be strong going forward. Um, you've seen spikes in um, in the LNG price because of the extreme winters conditions have had in both China and all of North uh, Northern Hemisphere. Uh, they won't they won't last. Uh, and again, there's a normalisation. But generally speaking, the demand for LNG is is um, is certainly uh, positive. Um, Woodside are in a very, very strong position. The balance sheet's in good shape. Um, the difference between our fair, uh, our fair value and the market price, uh, a lot of it is de dependent on um, the third train coming in um, uh, at Pluto. And that's probably worth about at least 14 or $15. And, and um, now that the, uh, the um, oil price has basically caught up to our long-term uh, forecast uh, at sixty dollars, then we would see, you know, we would see a, a, a better chance now, as the as the uh, the global economy recovers and energy demand increases, um, that uh, we should see uh, a, a closing of that gap between the market price uh, and the fair value. And that uh, the energy sector in in our coverage is the only sector that is on a cap market cap weighted basis, the only sector selling at a discount. And it's at about, I think from memory, 23% uh, discount to our combined fair value. And that the, you're seeing that in the recommendations of Beach, Santos, Oil Search and Woodside. Okay. Um, second part of that question from Joe Rodrigo concerns iron ore. He asks, um, any comments on what's driving the price and whether there's any data on Chinese stockpiling it? Well, the Chinese, you know, are, are, are pretty good at masking things. Um, look, the, the, the iron ore price is where it is because of Chinese demand and very little else, um, the, albeit that the supply side of it has been hurt by obviously Brazil. Um, but the Australian uh, iron ore miners have had, had, a, had a picnic uh, and shareholders um, have been showered with, with, with dividends. Um, I noticed only in the last couple of days, and don't forget the uh, the uh, 14th five-year um, plan is going to be announced uh, by uh, President Xi only in the, in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, that'll cover 21 to 25. Watch for a de-emphasisation in terms of infrastructure. Uh, look for them to pump up the uh, domestic economy and get the consumption side of that going. Uh, that doesn't mean to say they're going to pull the brake on uh, exports, but they will, they will be driving that domestic economy. They, they want to be more self-reliant. They, 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 they understand that the, 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 it's hostile out there in terms of the anti-Chinese um, sentiment. Um, but watch for the de-emphasisation of infrastructure. The, the, fair, uh, uh, the uh, um, fixed asset investment is likely to slow and slow quite sh sharply. 
and therefore I would think that whilst the uh, iron ore prices could stay high for next uh, few months, maybe six months, look for them to start peeling off back end of 2021 and th all the way through 2022 and beyond. Okay, and another company that Joe Rodrigo asks about, which is China um, facing, is A2 Milk, of course, which fell uh, by about 15%, I think, last week. Um, what do you make of that, Joe Rodrigo asks? Well, it's, it's not a stock that I covered very, very closely. Not, not, uh, but the thing is that there again, China influenced um, the disruptions within the um, uh, customers and distributors. Um, and, um, you know, the outlook f uh, comments from the, the company were just, you know, so-so. Um, I would think that, you know, if the if the A2 infant milk thing has got legs, and I suspect it has, um, then China will continue to, 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 to buy their product um, and the, the, the stock does look um, a little bit cheap at the moment. Okay. I'm Lex Hall. I'm with Peter Warns. We're discussing the February earnings season report with Peter and we welcome your questions. They're flowing in. Uh, Barry asks, will the Woolworths demerger um, take a similar, of Endeavour, take a similar path to its demerger with Coles, do you think? Well, I'll drink to that. Um, <laughs> I think I think once you demerge those, those like good, strong operations, um, you find they go to, they can potentially go to another level. Um, you've got in, individual management um, more focused, you know, coals coming out of West Farmers. I'm not blaming, I'm not saying West Farmers management didn't have their eye on coals, but what I'm saying is that they, 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 they can make their own, you know, uh, policy and, and, and get, go, from, uh, go from there. I think uh, Endeavour coming out of Woolworths will be the same situation. Uh, look, the two, best, the, the two best retail franchises I see out there, and I, I, I rate it because if you can get in, if you can't get in the parking a lot, I think it's a good franchise. And they, those two are Bunnings and and and, and Big du and um, uh, Dan Murphy's. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think that if it's priced well, and I think it will be, there will be distribution, obviously, to Woolworths shareholders. Um, we all, we're Australians. We all like a tipple every now and again, uh, probably more frequently than 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 not. And um, they they've got the first mover advantage in big box liquor no one's going to beat them at it uh coals are too far behind and and won't it couldn't can't, can't afford the capital to get them get them in, into a, a, a major uh, competitive position and so i just see um uh endeavor going from strength to strength okay and if there are more lockdowns we'll probably be drinking more won't we well, hopefully there's not going to be any of that. That doesn't stop me ever to <laughs> um, David asks a question that probably many of you are asking, and that's um, the future of Afterpay. The valuation between reviewers is huge. What do you what do you think of Afterpay and the buy now, pay later sector, Peter? Well, if anyone can tell me that Afterpay aren't providing credit, then I'm here to listen and listen for as long as you can try to convince me that they're not. They are in the credit market. Uh, there will be regulation, I believe, over that space as it becomes more and more uh, immersed in the economy. There will be increased competition from bigger companies that have to pay, and I'm talking about the uh, the PayPal's and the uh, and the US uh, cards, who will come come down and and offer similar products. And the, the merchant margin, which is where Afterpay do make the money, will come under a lot of pressure. And uh, that's where I think that uh, the, uh, the jury's still out. Um, it looks very, very expensive to me. Um, and I just don't know when they'll turn a profit. Have you ever held? Having, having said, but having said that, I, what I have watched and what I've watched about a lot of big tech companies in the U.S., Amazon's and Microsoft's and what have you, in their infancy, they didn't make a profit either, and they were spending a hell of a lot on marketing. And I've looked at what Afterpay are spending on marketing, and in the last six months, 
they spent more, I think it was close to 70 million on marketing than they did in all of 2020 um, financial year. In other words, they've, 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 they've spent that and a half. And if you go back and have a look from the previous three or four years, that, that, that uh, expense has just skyrocketed. So they're out there making sure that everyone who wants to go and buy anything potentially could be an afterpay customer. So just to elaborate on that to marketing, which obviously means trying to expand your brand, which is a, a moat source, right? So will, will that be a, a moat company one well, day? Well, ultimately, if they, if, 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 absolutely, it'll be an Amazon or a Microsoft or what have you, if they can get it right. But again, in, in the infancy, those, those things, the, the share price will normalise. It'll come back a little bit. You wouldn't, I wouldn't be there at the moment, uh, but yes, it's, they're a big player. They're capped now at you know thirty or forty billion dollars. Um, they're trying to get partnerships with you know meaningful companies and what have you. Um, they're on a roll, but there is a price for the roll. Um, and don't forget, um, discounted cash flow is how you value companies, uh, and we've got to see a bit more cash flow. Okay. Uh, let's switch to gold. Peter, Uma would like to know about your gold price predict prediction. Uh, it's a uh, fairly adventurous well, question. Uh, yeah, gold is it's a two, two-edged sword. Um, on the run through 2000, it was because of the, the problems we were having with, um, with uh, COVID, um, geopolitical tensions, and we had bond yields at zero. Uh, they are all tailwinds for gold. What's changed um, to make the the the, the, uh, the price of the commodity come back from let's say 2200 peak uh, to 1700? One, uh, we've got vaccine vaccines. Two, we have a recovery, and three, we've got bond yields on the move. And gold doesn't like that. Gold likes conflict upheaval, uncertainty. We're getting more uns we're getting more certainty as the vaccines are rolled out. We're getting more certainty as the recovery gathers uh, traction. And, and bond yields are obviously, because gold does not produce any income, um, bond yields moving north is negative for gold because that, that is, that is uh, a risk-free uh, yield that that gold obviously can't provide. I think bond yields, forget what the Reserve Bank did yesterday and forget what the Federal Reserve is doing in the US. They can't take on the bond market. They might take it on for the short term, but they will not win in the long term. And bond yields are rising. The 40 year bond bull market is over. Inflation is going to rise and the official cash rate in Australia will not be at 0.1 in 2024. Okay, there you go. Nice revelation for you. Susan asks, Peter, could you please explain why uh, fixed interest has dropped almost 3% in the past month? Fixed interest? Mm. Uh, must be talking about. Are you talking? I would just have to clarify that. Are you talking hybrid, hybrids, or or is it? Um, why don't we? Why don't I? Like, I'll ask you about. Um, let's talk about because you talked about some hybrid issues from Macquarie and CBA, which I think we're offering. You said they weren't worth looking at because they were two point seven five, and you could get a better yield on Commonwealth Bank. Yeah. Well, yes. Because and well, what. Is it Elizabeth, was it? Uh, this is Susan. Oh, Susan. Yep. Well, th don't forget, you you must be talking about fixed interest prices. So obviously they move in, in the opposite direction to yield. So mm -hmm. if the yield goes up, the price goes, um, so if the yield goes up, the price goes down. Yep. So it must be fixed interest prices. And that's just a reflection of what's happening in the yield, in the, in the, in the bond market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the risk-free 10-year yield uh, near 2% a couple of days ago. Well, it, it, any fixed interest um, instrument that's you know going off that benchmark, its yields are going north, and so the prices are going south, and that's what's happened in the uh, in the you've seen that in the um, 
in uh, the hybrid market. The, mm -hmm. the hybrid market has the stocks, the, the, the prices have come down quite sharply. Um, and, and, and don't forget, uh, if we're, if we're, don't forget I keep talking about margin of safety um, that you've got to have in your equity dealings, but you'll, don't forget there's margin of safety in bond, the bond market as well. Uh, don't forget that when we're in a situation like we've been in where inflation is low and interest rates are low, the equity risk premium is also low. When you start seeing bond yields turn and move up and inflation start turning up, then your equity risk premium starts moving higher. Mm -hmm. Over the long term, the equity risk premium is somewhere before, between 4 and 6%. Now, make sure that you those things stay in place. Now, what you can look at the moment, say, for example, what is that, what is that equity risk uh, premium? Well, what it is... It's the difference between the earnings yield of a company and the risk-free rate. So if the risk-free rate of a 10-year bond is 2%, and let's use that because it will be there directly, mm -hmm. and a stock is selling on a PE of 20, that means, that, and, the, and the PE is the, and the earnings yield is the inver, inversion of that, so the, the earnings yield becomes 5, so 5% earnings yield, 2% risk-free yield, my equity premium, three. What did I say before? Four to six. You better be careful about buying high PE stocks mm. when interest rates start moving north and inflation start when it's moving north. Yep. Be very, very careful. Okay. That was a question I was going to ask you, actually, on the, the implications for companies. Mim uh, would like to sort of turn it over to travel and we can't um, have a webinar without talking about travel and some mm. of the other, other sectors that have been hit by COVID. Sydney Airport, is it a bond proxy? Is it more affected uh, by the bond market? If so, how, Mim asks? Well, it, it, those infrastructure stocks, Mim, are, uh, high, uh, have, a, have a lot of debt. Uh, the, 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 the debt's there because uh, their uh, their cash flow, their earnings, and the cash flow from how they what they generate um, is very very sustainable. Um, no one saw a COVID coming, um, but yes, uh, in the longer term, um, the transurbans and the airports will come back to normal. And uh, but what's what those companies have also done? They've cleaned up the balance sheet. They've raised new equity. So mm -hmm. the balance sheets are probably in best their best shape they've been for for Yonks. But um, uh, and going forward, you, you'll you'll see uh, their earnings re recover. But Sydney Airport, you'll only see domestic uh, uh, domestic planes and and uh, landing there. Uh, some freight obviously coming in, um, and some uh, uh, you know repatriation of um, Aussies still stranded. I don't think you're going to see inbound um, tourism. Grow, uh, uh, recover for a number of years. I don't think the Australian um, government is going to open up our shores to northern hemisphere inbound uh, tourism unless they've got they've had five jabs. Um, and heaven forbid, Alan Joyce becomes our um, our minister for for tourism. I mean, he has got a conflict. Does that mean a stock like Qantas just keeps falling and falling? Or? No, no, Qantas, Qantas, again, its balance sheet's in great shape uh, as well. Its cash flow, they've got, it's, its cash flow obviously, you know, decimated, but it, they will get back to probably, you know, the best part of 90% probably uh, of uh, domestic um, uh, domestic uh, traffic, uh, probably by the end of, um, certainly by the end of this year, mm. um, whereas the international, um, it, it won't get, it, it's, it's, you can you put a line through it. Mm. But but they make more money out of domestic and money Qantas free and flyers, and they do out of international anyway. Yeah. Um, and so, no, Qantas, but, but all these things, I think, are in the in the price of, uh, of Qantas. But that's, that's part of the economy that, unlike the retailers, the retailers, their, their, their peak has passed, in my opinion in terms of activity levels and sales and what have you. 
the, t the tourism and travel industry, they're still on the bones of their backside, and they, yeah. but they will, they will get up and they'll, they'll be strong again. But a lot of it's in the price already. Okay. Uh, Samir uh, wants to sort of turn the discussion towards um, methodology. He says he loves Morningstar analysis. He says we uh, quite rightly um, base much of the analysis on long term. We talk about the moat uh, strategy of a company, a wide moat company is a company that has a 20 year competitive advantage, for example. He says I'm focused on short term and would like to know what parameters we should use for picking stock for short term gains. Um, momentum, that really is the, the secret to short term, not investing, that's short term trading. You don't invest for the short term, you, you, you go to Ramwick or you can't go to Barangaroo, um, <laughs> but, you, but um, you, you are trading. Um, and momentum, which means more buyers and sellers will tell you that if you're on the right track. Um, and that's the only way that I see um, uh, uh, short term, you know, unless you've got good inside information. But I, I watch 52 week high lows, you know, stocks that are, that, that, that are moving into the 52 week high for, for the first time right. and what have you. They're there for a reason. And the reason is that people are buying them. Yeah. So I think it's it's momentum. It's it's I don't think it's a, a science at all. Okay, and volume, I suppose as well. Oh vo well, vo yeah. it what happens is that when they when stocks do have momentum, you know, it's like bees or honey. Yeah. Okay. Glenn uh, would like to talk about the dollar. Where do you see Peter the Australian dollar going versus the US dollar? Higher. And the only reason I say that is because the gap between or the spread between the 10 year Aussie yield and the 10 year US yield has reversed now and is in favor of the Australian dollar. In other words, that, that um, spread is the, 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 the US yield, the, sorry, the Australian yield is higher than the US yield. Capital is mobile, uh, unless you want to go and buy a 50 year Spanish bond at 145. <laughs> um, and, and therefore, that interest rate differential comes into play. Um, what about iron ore prices? Well, iron ore prices have lifted the uh, the A dollar. If they're coming off, well, it it um, it will not be a tailwind anymore. But I'm not saying that all of a sudden iron ore prices are going to come back from 170 to to, to 50. Yeah. They'll come back, I suspect, to the low 100s for a while and maybe just see, see what happens from there. You've got supply coming back on uh, from Brazil ultimately, and then you've got Simandu in, the, in Africa, uh, that down the track. But uh, look, you know, the Australian economy will uh, recover. It, it'll be, it, it'll, uh, it's done a lot better than most uh, countries out there. Um, we, uh, in the US dollar is under, will be under pressure because of the extent of fiscal and monetary policy that's just printed trillions and that dilutes every piece of paper that's pre out there in the pool mm -hmm. and so i think that the US, uh, dollar is going to be relatively weak against the australian dollar i can say the australian dollar through 80 uh despite what um the rba may or may not want to do okay I'm talking to Peter Warns. We're talking about the earnings uh, season wrap. I'm Lex Hall, Senior Editor with Morningstar, and we welcome your questions today. Uh, Dennis asks, and I'm looking around somewhere for our crystal ball, Peter, but I can't quite find it. Um, are you expecting a correction here? Dennis wants to know. Well, look, you, you saw the, the, the taper tantrum, if you like, um, uh, that you this last week on, uh, on bond yields. If I think bond yields are going to continue to go north, um, Bill Evans, who has the best record out there of economists, um, and I do think he's a shadow of the RBA, more on, I think, more on, um, on their, uh, their monetary policy in terms of quantitative easing rather than interest rates. But he says, he, he thinks that the 10-year um, uh, bond uh, by 2020, I think two or three, probably three, is going to be over 3%. Uh, 
Um, if we get a bond move back over to the equity markets coming down, what did I just say before about uh, equity risk premium? That will crunch the equity, but you will, you will see that you'll have to have six, seven, eight percent earnings yields to counter the rise in bond yields to get you over that four to six percent long term. Mm -hmm. And so what happens if you get an equity yield that moves from six to eight, um, earnings yield six to eight percent, mm -hmm. the PE just comes down. Simple. Hap it's, that's what's been happening since stock markets were created. Yep. All right. Um, we warned about not extrapolating, but Lisa asks, is this season foreshadowing a shift away from growth back to value stocks, do you think? Well, it, 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 it will. And because again, uh, this uh, equity risk premium and the earnings yield plays to the value and it plays to the lower uh, PE stocks. And so um, you, you will see that, that the high growth companies that are bonds yield sensitive and, and they will come under some pressure should bond yields do what the, you saw what happened to the fangs in the NASDAQ and what happened. Yes, it was up last night and because they said it'll be, well, everything will be okay. Um, look, you know, what I've written for this week and you, what you'll see it in um, in overview on Thursday. I've also suggested that when um, when Phil Lowe goes to have his COVID vaccination, he gets a precautionary tetanus vaccination as well, because that nail that he's nailed the uh, the official cash rate uh, down with will start protruding dangerously <laughs> way before 2024. <laughs> Um, let's talk about a specific stock and one that Morningstar subscribers are pretty interested in, and that's AGL. Um, Emma, my colleague, is going to write about that this week. She's going to chat to the analyst, Adrian Atkins, who covers it. Um, what are your thoughts on AGL? Well, I can remember covering this stock about 20 years, 30 years ago. Len Bleaser was the boss, and it was fascinating and a great company. I'm not saying it's not a great company now, but things have changed, obviously, with... Uh, climate change and and how we generate uh, uh, our power. Uh, the, as far as the jury's concerned, they've, they've, they've all voted and saying, well, there's no such thing as, um, uh, as uh, coal fired uh, base power. It's all going to be solar and wind. Well, um, close down all coal fired power stations and uh, there'll be a lot of blackouts before we'll be able to say solar and wind are going to be our base load power source. That is decades away. Uh, a combination of coal and gas, and you still have to have coal, unfortunately or unfortunately, um, uh, that is the reliable, like reliable base load power. If it ain't shining and it's not blowing, then you can't generate renewable power. And batteries, um, they're not the answer either. Um, they will store power for a short term. Uh, but so AGL is in a situation where um, wholesale prices, electricity prices are, are, are low, low, low. Um, if they've got a big generation operation, um, through their coal mines and, and a couple of uh, wind power uh, operations, but basically coal fired um, and, uh, and a, a retail operation. Well, they're making money in the retail operation, but losing money in the generation. About a year and a half ago, it was the exact opposite because wholesale prices were through the roof and, uh, and retail um, was okay. So I think AGL, I think patience, um, it, it, the franchise is still very powerful. They've got a very, very strong market share with them, themselves and Origin and Energy Australia. I'm just talking, you know, kind of East Coast, if you like. 
Um, so, uh, you know, uh, those franchises are, are valuable. Um, or what they put into them, obviously they're trying to, you know, put in some, you know, telco stuff and this and what have you. But I still think they'll be an energy company for a, a, quite a while. Okay. Sinead would like to talk about the future of Australian tech stocks, names like App and Altium, uh, WiseTech, and how they're expected to perform in 2021. Sinead, I should also point you to, there's a story on the website at the moment by Nikki Bouliufus, who talks about that in particular. So feel free to have a look on morningstar.com.au um, and you can find out more about that in particular. But Peter, you may or may not have a thought on those three. Well, I'm sorry, but um, I hate passing the, uh, the buck, but um, I, you'd get more out of Nikki's uh, story than what you're going to get out of me. All right. Well, we do have a lot of, a lot of questions. So Sinead, please um, check out that story. Uh, Alistair asks, and Emma has put in brackets here, personal advice warning. So um, let's uh, just take that in note. He wants to talk about um, managed funds with global uh, exposure. Is there a favourable time with the high dollar? For example, will investing now into the US market, which is expected to perform well this year, and the Aussie dollar drops mid-year, will I get a better return? Will investing into the US market, which is expected to perform well this year, and the Aussie dollar drops mid-year, will that result in a better return? Well, if are you are you investing in currency or are you investing in equities? Then make that decision. You know, you've got choices and decisions in life. Make make the choice and then make the decision. If you want to if you want to invest in the in the currency, well, if you want to invest in the US dollar, there's plenty of ways to do that and, and you know do it straight. The, the managed funds is probably a clumsy vehicle to to play the currency. Um, the managed funds that are out there, I would think that you know, uh, Magellan has has the best record. I think, in terms of listed companies in the international space, and um, we we think they're at reasonable value at this point in time. But again, um, <clears throat> uh, as I said, are you investing in the companies uh, that, that they invest in, um, or are you trying to play the currency? Okay. If we could just um, return, we'll do Mem a favour, just get, go back to Woolworths. Um, would it be better to hold until the demerger of the liquor arm, Mem would like to know? <coughs> well, you, if you don't, you, you, the risk is that you buy Endeavour at a higher price. So in other words, let's just say, for example, I'm just plucking a number out of the air. If, if Woolworths, if the merger goes through and it will, and Woolworths is selling, let's say forty dollars, and you get a one-for-one one entitlement uh, uh, for your endeavour, and let's just say that endeavour is, is ten, and therefore Woolworths comes back to thirty. If you if you decide to wait, then the, the, I'll bet that endeavour comes on at twelve. Mm -hmm. And so your, your 40 is 42. So I think that what I'm saying is that, I, Peter warns, I would hold until you get your in specie distribution. Okay. Peter, I'm going to ask you to put your, uh, your cryptocurrency hat on for a second, if you've got one. David uh, has got a couple of, has got a question. So is Kim, and I might roll these into one. David, prefaces his comment by his question by saying, since Bitcoin is used by criminals, do you think it is possible the government will ban it? And if so, will Bitcoin holders be compensated for their loss by governments? Interesting question. And Kim asks, where do you see crypto going com compared, compared to gold as an anti-inflation investment? So first, let's talk about the potential reimbursement. Um, and then um, crypto is, is compared to gold as an anti-inflation inflation investment mm. well Bit bitcoin might be used by criminals but um i also saw a, a, a semi-trailer and get pulled over by the cops um coming across the nullarbor about three weeks ago and out popped 32 million dollars worth of australian dollar banknotes and and i'm pretty sure that that had some criminal behind it as well <laughs> um so um i look bitcoin is what it is 
the only thing it's got going for it, in my opinion, is it will become more and more use, usable and, and, and tradable. Uh, I see Goldman Sachs are now going to start covering it and, and doing things and what have you. But the thing, it's, if it's got something going for it, it is that it's a closed pool. Gold continues to be mined and every piece of gold that has been mined is still in existence. Bitcoin has got 21 million ceiling and coming down by a factor every year by year by year. So its pool is shrinking, gold increases, and you know what happens to currency because of the printing press. So the scarcity value of Bitcoin is one of the boxes that I would tick. Who uses it? Why they use it? It's got nothing to do with should you buy it, and mm. I've got no idea should you buy it at all. Um, can it be an inflation hedge? Possibly, if enough people get on board. And there's a lot of look. Forget the traders and the speculators and what have you. you get the hardcore, and there's more people starting to become hardcore believers in Bitcoin you know and and that's and if it becomes more acceptable in terms of a a means of exchange yep. then it has got some legs but have has peter warren's got bitcoin no uh ryan asks and this is a question you'll like peter uh what's the likelihood of modern monetary theory being put into practice even if it's applied unofficially well it's basically happening now I mean, you know, the central banks can say what they like, that we aren't embracing it. But as quick as the government is um, is uh, printing money, mm -hmm. the central banks are buying buying the bond. I mean, the, the ink is still dry on the it isn't dry on the on the on on the certificate, and they're buying it. Um, so we've already it's already kind of in place already. Uh, that will, I think that will change. I mean, I, I think the central banks have got themselves into a real problem because they've printed so much money and their balance sheets are now so extended, way, way beyond what they were in the GFC. They probably don't want inflation to, to, to get away mm -hmm. because given that situation, how do they then go and defend it? Yeah. All the bullets have been, you know, they are out of ammunition. Mm. So I, you know, I, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Isn't I, it? Yes, it is a tricky one. I, you yeah. know, I, you know, it, it's there. It's in play already. Okay. Um, anonymous uh, attendee, thanks for your question, a general question. What are the main figures, Peter, when analysts are looking at financial reports? And you probably just spend a, a few. A minute or so on that, I suppose. Well, in my opinion, cash is king. Yeah. Uh, straight to I. Yes, you acknowledge the revenue and the bottom line and all this type of thing, but you go straight to the cash flow statement. Mm -hmm. That's where I I think more people spend more time now, and they should, because valuation is based on the discounted uh, the discounted future cash flow. And you are looking for sustainable cash flow, uh, and the more sustainable, the wider the moat, mm -hmm. and that's what you're looking for. So I would look look at those those um, uh, that's part that part of the financials. Also, you can look at working capital. I mean, you the the, the supermarkets you know get a get a, a a big lift because they've got negative working capital. You know, mm. you go in and pay in 30 seconds and they pay their suppliers 30 days, maybe. So right. they've got, they, they, they haven't got money tied up in debtors and, 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 and what have you. So uh, working capital is also something that you could you, you should, you know, be cognizant of. Uh, but, you know, as I say, the cash flow statement is um, is 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 the uh, the goal mine. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go back to China briefly, because we did, you and I both did a video in which we talked about investing in, in China. Do you have an update on that? You 
alluded to it earlier. Well, I mean, you know, it'll be interesting to see what uh, Zai has to say in a couple of weeks, but it's, all, it's already out there that, you know, the dual policy of, um, you know, uh, external, internal, a rebalancing of that. Um, uh, I, I think that, you know, Chinese growth, I mean, people say, oh, Chinese growth is going to slow, going to slow. Of course it's going to slow if it's doubled in the last 10 years in terms of the economy size of the economy so of course it's got to slow yes it'll probably have a it came out of 2020 with a six in front of it will it finish 2021 with a six in front of it well possibly not um but one hell of an economy one hell of a recovery uh you know we can only you know stand in in awe of, of what they've done uh, we might question how they got there but still in all it, it is a terrific uh, economy, it, uh, but, it, but growth will slow, uh, but their focus will be now on consumer, the consumer, um, and getting wages up there as well. So, you know, uh, uh, it's, a, it, it, um, it's a, serious, um, a serious player in the global scene. Okay. Um, one comment here on rare earths and uranium investing in that. Do you have a, a view on that in particular? Well, I think uranium um, is is part of the uh, part of the whole solution of you know kind of um, reduced emissions. Um, don't worry about Fukushima and and those. I think accidents do happen. Um, you know, if a, if a wind turbine fell over and killed a few people and you'd probably say oh well, it's dangerous as well um, the thing is that that it's emission free it's very efficient um, and Australia could do very very well out of it because we are a major uh, we're not a major producer but we've got a lot of of it here but we could also uh, be a major uh, uh, part of the disposal of, mm. of waste stick it in the middle of nowhere out there and um, and make a, a hell of a lot of money. So I, I think uranium is is part of it. The rare earths is obviously, you know, uh, quite, you know, quite scientific and and, and tech uh, related and what have you. And, and I, I the way that the way that the, the things are moving, more and more people are going to want more and more rare earth. Mm -hmm. Now, how you play it, you know, I don't know, and there's Linus there and what have you, but, and and um, I see Iluka's got a small operation there at Eniaba now in the West and and what have you, but, you know, those things like, you know, the, the lithium and, and, and what have you, the, the world is moving that way. So all you can see is probably tailwinds for, you know, uh, rare earths. Uh, I, and I think that uranium, the uranium price is, uh, is probably going to go higher. Okay. I want to finish on a, a political note because I know I'll, I'll get a rise out of you. Um, I remember last year, Anton, or maybe the year before, Anton Taliaferro said if Australia was a, a company, you wouldn't invest in it. Uh, Lisa asks, if the Australian government were a public company, how would you rate its performance this season? Well, uh, no, I'd rate the Australian government's performance in terms of controlling coronavirus very highly. Um, no, very few countries, possibly with the exception of our neighbours across the ditch, um, have been able to control it and its and its spread. And I suspect it's just a geographical thing. We're an island; we can just close the thing down. You don't close, you know, the US. But, but in addition to that, we as a country. The bipartisanship shown between the two parties to get the stimulus out there and get that out there quick was second to none. Look what's happening in the US. They're still trying to get 1.9 trillion through the Senate. The thing ran out in, on July 31. What a flaming disaster that place is. A place that quite frankly, if I never see again, it wouldn't worry me. <laughs> Um, and so I, on that basis, I'd, I'd mark them, you know, fairly, fairly well. Um, we, we can't get out of the debt that we've got. It's, it's there and it's going to stay there and it's going to have to be repaid. 
and if the bond yields go north, it's going to get a bit more expensive. But it had to be done. It protected household consumption and it protected our capital system. Okay. You can find Peter's earnings season wrap on morningstar.com.au and on premium.morningstar.com.au. Remember to join us on Twitter, join us on Facebook. Uh, take a trial, it's free. Uh, you can get great insights into uh, company valuations, uh, investing basics pieces, uh, and a, a lot of other useful stuff for your investing. Peter, I'd like to thank you again today for your insights and uh, being as candid and as expansive as usual. So thanks very much for that. More than a pleasure, Alex, and more than a pleasure to um, talk to all our subscribers um, anytime, any place. All right. Uh, good luck in your investing journey. Thanks to Will Ton and Emma Rappaport behind the scenes. And we look forward to seeing you for another webinar. The next one is on Thursday. So please join us then. Until then, all the best. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.